ओम भूर्भुव स्वह तत्सवितोरवरेण्यम भर्गो दीम धीय यो न प्रचोदया शांति 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 नमस्ते माय डियर फ्रेंड्स दिस इज थर्ड वीडियो ऑन विवेक चूड़ामणि ऑफ आदि शंकराचार्य दिस वीडियो स्टार्ट्स विथ वर्ष नंबर ट्वेंटी थ्री विषे भय प्रावर्त सथापनम सब सब गोल के उभे सामी इंद्रिया सदम है प्री कीर्ति है बाया नाल लंबनम वर्तरेशो पर तिरुत्तमा स्टीरिंग बोथ काइंड ऑफ सेंस ऑर्गन्स ऑफ नॉलेज एंड एक्शन अवे फ्रॉम देयर सेंस ऑब्जेक्ट्स एंड प्लेसिंग देम इन देयर रेस्पेक्टिव सेंटर्स ऑफ एक्टिविटी इज कॉल्ड दमा सेल्फ कंट्रोल द बेस्ट उपरति सेल्फ विदड्रॉल इज दैट कंडीशन ऑफ द थॉट वेव्स इन विच दे आर फ्री फ्रॉम द influences of external objects in this verse we have the explanations of two more requirements of the mind and intellect which are essential in an aspirant they are dama and uparti compared with sama dama is a system of discipline concerned with a relatively outer field since it prescribes a control for the sense organs to withdraw our mental rays that shoot out through the sense organs for the perception of their respective sets of objects and to absorb those rays of perception within the sense organs is dama or self control that is dama is the control of the sense organs while sama is a condition experienced by the mind when it does not function in worldly activities but is quietly settled upon the contemplation of the supreme goal when one has gained a degree of proficiency in sama and dama uparti self withdrawal automatically takes place wherein the seeker's mental condition is such that it no longer gets affected by any disturbances created by external objects when we think of these requirements it is possible that we think of them as very delicate difficult and distressing feats but in fact the more we practice them the more easily will we understand that after all this is but a verbal explanation of the state of mind of anyone who is trying to achieve or execute any great work even on a material plane we find these qualifications are essential for a person who wants unqualified success in his activities in any successful business man to be observe a certain amount of self control within as well as without and also uparti at least while he is at his desk of course the comparison of these qualities with the qualities exhibited by the materialist or the money hunter is not fair because a seeker needs a subtlety a million times more than the materialist yet to a large extent we can appreciate and understand these qualifications within ourselves when we watch for them and experience them as available in our work a day world 
वर्ष नंबर ट्वेंटी फोर सहनम सर्व दुखाना प्रतिकार पूर्वकम चिंता विलाप रहितम सा तितिक्षा निगध्यते तितिक्षा इज द कैपेसिटी टू एंड्योर ऑल सोरोस एंड सफरिंग्स विदाउट स्ट्रगलिंग फॉर रीड्रेस और फॉर रिवेंज बीइंग ऑलवेज फ्री फ्रॉम एंजाइटी और लिमेंट ओवर देम describing the fourth psychological qualification in a man of true spiritual stamina sankra gives a full and scientific definition of the quality of silent endurance which is glorified in all the religions of the world meek surrender and silent suffering are the watchwords in all religious disciplines this quality to endure and to suffer for a cause which has been accepted by the individual as the ideal and the perfect finds a place in every great philosophy whether it is religious or secular in order to bring about a revolution even in the world outside the revolutionaries are called upon to make silent sacrifices in order to establish in life how much more essential is it than in the inner revolution of an individual who is trying to free himself from his psychological and intellectual confines this spirit of titiksha is to be cultivated and pursued to ensure success in all schemes of subjective re- rehabilitation it is a great pity that many people indulge in acts of perversion in the name of titiksha i have met a number of unintelligent people who in the name of spiritual seeking persecute themselves physically and mentally and as a result of their self persecution all they gain at the end of years of suffering is a crooked ugly deformed mind they do not ever achieve the least amount of inward beauty or perfection discarding clothes or starving oneself to a skinny existence denying the body its bare necessities or giving unnecessary pain to the mind running away from life or preserving oneself on inhuman diets in solitary caves living an animal life open to a brutal climate or breaking the body in an effort to make it endure more discomforts none of this is true titiksha and yet how many a blind seeker has founded on this rock of ignorance titiksha forbearance is that faculty of the mind which it maintains when intellectually it is governed by a tempo and a conviction which is complete and self ordained divine and noble when the intellect is fully convinced of its accepted values of life of the sacredness of its goal thereafter in trying to gain it the mind smilingly faces all difficulties and obstacles this capacity of the mind to accommodate cheerfully all its vicissitudes and patiently ignore any obstacles that might come its way is titiksha verse number 25 shastrasya guru vakyasya satya buddhaya dharana sa sardha kathita सद्भिर्या वस्तु 
उपलभ्यते दैट बाई विच वन अंडरस्टैंड द एग्जैक्ट इम्पोर्ट ऑफ द स्क्रिप्चर्स एज वेल एज द प्रेगनेंट वर्ड ऑफ एडवाइस ऑफ द प्रिसेप्टर इज कॉल्ड श्रद्धा बाय द वाइज बाय दिस अलोन डज रियलिटी बिकम मैनिफेस्टली क्लियर श्रद्धा इज द फिफ्थ ऑफ द क्वालिफिकेशन फाइंड नेसेसरी इन एन एस्पिरेंट पर हैप्स नो अदर स्पिरिचुअल टर्म हैज बीन सो बैडली मोल्ड बाय द प्रिस्ट क्लास एंड सो प्रोफिटेबली पोलिटेड बाय द lady in hinduism in the name of shraddha a perverted set of priests start trading upon the highly credulous but extremely ignorant community shamelessly but successfully shraddha is not blind faith as it is generally understood it is very clear in the definition of the acharya that shraddha is a healthy attempt at a clear intellectual appreciation of the secret depths of the significances underlying the words of the scriptures and the teacher indeed this is an essential requisite for anyone trying to master the truths of the scriptures the scriptures give us through a technique of suggestions as clear a description of the infinite truth as is possible through finite sounds and words as such the pure consciousness which is the core of reality cannot be defined or expressed in words and this supreme point of human evolution can only be indicated by the scriptures so an honest and sincere effort on the part of the readers and students is absolutely necessary if the words indicating the truth are to be correctly interpreted understood and efficiently made use of this capacity through effort to realize the words of the scriptures in all their suggestiveness is termed as shraddha we need a certain amount of shraddha even in our everyday life when my friend narrates to me how he fell in love or how he was insulted by someone in his narration it is not so much the words that give me a complete idea of what he experienced but it is my shraddha in his words that illumines for me in all vividness his experiences if in the material world it is my shraddha in the words of the poet that makes me see the face of beauty if it is my shraddha in the strokes and colors of the canvas that makes me realize the experience of the artist if it is my shraddha in a given prospect that gives me a glimpse of its message of beauty and innocence if in the gross outer world shraddha is so essential how much more should it be so in my attempt to understand the suggestive beauty the indicative message and the implied meanings of the pregnant words of the scriptures and of the teacher verse number 26 sarvada sathapanam buddhe shuddhe brahmani sarvatha तत् समाधान मीतुयुक्त नेतु चितस्य लालनम समाधाना ट्रैंक्विलिटी इज दैट कंडीशन व्हेन द माइंड इज कांस्टेंटली एंगेज्ड इन द टोटल कंटेम्पलेशन ऑफ द सुप्रीम रियलिटी एंड इट इज नॉट गेंड थ्रू एनी अमाउंट ऑफ इंटेलेक्चुअल ऑसिलेशंस in any country generally the atheist or the vehement critics of the scriptures 
attract the people towards an independent inquiry into the main text and there is nothing basically wrong in this but when we find that our men of culture supposedly leaving the values that have been advised behave as low despicable creatures with crumbling values necessarily the man of average intelligence immediately comes to the conclusion that there is something fundamental fundamentally wrong with the tradition it is the lip vedantins vedantins and pseudo seekers who have damaged our sacred edifice of perfection and truth more than a gazanvi or an aurangzeb it is these half baked vedantins and bhaktas who have dealt mortal mortal wounds upon the revered body of our society as we look round we find that society falls into two groups the believers and the non believers even among the believers there are those who in their cowardice dare not face life squarely and have therefore come to blindly accept some superstitious ideas of religion they live their lives aimlessly in undefined fears and vague tremblings such ineffectual beings roaming about in languorous idleness are only procreating more and more non believers in a healthy society those who are alive to the beauties of life and the dignity of human existence who believe in the noble things of life such educated and healthy men do not subscribe to a faith that parades itself as self expression and a frog like existence in their mental and intellectual lives samadhana as it is understood today is an indifferent attitude towards both good and bad especially towards insults and failures threats and despair it is believed that samadhana is the mental attitude of an individual who has completely hardened himself and has grown to be insensible to the lessons of failures and the errors of insult the acharya's definition does not sanction such a superstitious belief sankara is quite emphatic when he defines samadhana as a state of poise and tranquility that the mind gains when it is trained sufficiently to revel continuously in the concept of a perfect ideal at once universal and omnipotent samadhana is not that state of the mind where in cowardice the individual sits quietly not daring to face life and its challenges but at the same time in the secret of his bosom goes on lamenting against the scheme of destiny that he has to face in life the tossings of the mind created by passive revolts against life are his only gains and if physically and intellectually he accepts them all silently in consummate cowardice it is not samadhana samadhana is the state of mental equilibrium which comes to one when intellectually one has unshakable foundations and mentally when one soars to the highest pinnacles of greater visions when we are when we are on the ground our neighbors may be a nuisance to us there may even be bitter hatred between us say because of a land dispute but when we have taken off in a plan these bickerings seem to have no meaning from those tremendous heights 
my property and my neighbor property seem to merge into one unbroken expanse of beauty in an aerial view of the world there are no disquieting mental agitations because in that vision of oneness the little differences of opinion about boundary line pale into in significance similarly when a spiritual aspirant raises himself into greater ambits of spiritual vision his mind can no longer entertain any agitation at the ordinary levels of likes and dislikes this poise gained as a result of constant contemplation on the supreme and the divine is termed as samadhana and naturally this becomes special qualification for every seeker on the path so then these are the six great qualifications that are essential psychological traits in a fully evolved man who alone can walk the last lap of this journey with hope and success stanza number 27 ahankar adi dehantan bandhan agyan kal kalpitan sab sab rupav bodhen muktim ichha mumukshta mumukshtava is the impatient and burning desire to release oneself by realizing the real nature of one's self from all bondages of egoism to the body etc which are bondages created by ignorance in this discussion we have spoken of number 1 discriminative capacity to separate the real from the unreal too capacity to detest ourselves completely from the false which we have now rightly understood as unreal three calmness self control inner peace forbearance faith and self settledness which are the positive qualities of the head and heart to be consciously developed now last in the series four a complete definition of the spirit of seeking that is essential in every new fight is given the burning aspiration of a seeker should not be an idle enthusiasm to gain some unknown goal through some mysterious intervention of a god or a teacher he should definitely know what are his limitations and also the causes for them he must be clear about his goal and the various techniques and paths by which he can attain it all these points are hinted at in this small pithy verse because of the non apprehension of our real nature misapprehensions about ourselves arise in our mind the identification with the body mind and intellect together called the ego is what gives us our sense of limitations the limitations do not belong to the self for it is infinite and absolute it is perfection while forgetting our real nature we come to look upon ourselves to be something other than what we actually are and this misconstrued personality is the sufferer the finite the mortal to re- to rediscover ourselves is to end all our sorrows this is the consummate point of evolution ilala ji after a substantial meal retires to a comfortable bed with his wife and children to take rest there he dreams that he is destitute into a wide world where in a jungle famished and broken of spirit he is looking for safety and shelter 
he is pursued relentlessly by a hungry lion. The Lalaji pants and runs to save himself and consequently jumps into the Ganges and the touch of the cold water wakes him up only to find that he is profusely perspiring in his own little room. The dreamer in Lalaji, forgetting his own real identity in which he was in all security sleeping with his wife and children, came to identify himself with his own mental creation and thus became the destitute of his own dream. The moment he woke up, he rediscovered his real identity. He need not then run to the closet to take his gun, open the door and walk out into the darkness, if not to kill, at least to frighten the lion. The moment he woke up, he understood that he had never been famished and that he was never in a jungle and that the lion was nothing but a creation of his own mind. In the ignorance of our real nature, we start identifying with our egocentric concepts such as I am the body, I am the mind and I am the intellect. And thereafter, the conditions of the body, mind and intellect in my stupidity become my conditions. To end this ignorance is to gain the wisdom of reality. He who has understood the logic of the true philosophical concept of the self and the Vedantic explanation of his seeming sense of finitude and limitations is the true seeker. Therefore, it is evident that a mumukshu is not a blind seeker vaguely wanting some unknown pleasure or development within himself by the practice of some pseudo-spiritual activities pursued only at a given time during the day. To be a seeker only for half an hour in the morning and another half an hour in the evening is not to be a right pursuer of knowledge. To rediscover ourselves is to invite into our life the cognition of a greater intellect and a divine consciousness. In order to turn the entire beam of my consciousness upon myself, I need to purify my mind and intellect and then slowly and steadily give them a turn so that they may come to contemplate upon themselves. This inner revolution cannot be accomplished as a half-hearted hobby, but it can only be the result of a lifelong dedication and a full-time endeavor. Such a true seeker who is ready to live every moment of his life in a difficult pursuit of the real is a momokshu. Verse number 28 Mand Madhyam Rupabhi Vairagyan Samadhina Prashadayan Guru Seyam Pravirdha Suyate Phalam Half-hearted and mediocre aspiration, aspirations in a seeker may also come to bear fruit being increased by the grace of the Guru and by means of re renunciation, calmness, etc. The burning desire for redemption from one's known weaknesses and limitations can be increased and kept at its highest tempo when through slow but steady pursuits of the six qualities enumerated above and through detachment one develops them by developing a capacity to discriminate between the real and the unreal. When one has gained an easy control over oneself in renouncing that which is unreal, when one has psychologically cultivated by steady and conscious effort the 
qualities of self control tranquility of mind inward peace endurance faith and mental poise then one's aspirations gain an as and an irresistible effectiveness these four great qualities have among themselves such a relationship that having developed one the other to come to flourish in the personality so even if one has only half hearted or mediocre aspirations one need not despair if one assiduously cultivates any one of these qualities one will definitely feel a greater longing for the highest the guru grace trick has been a very lucrative profession in our country in recent years the credulous public demanding cheap methods for the highest gains becomes an easy prey for the self appointed gurus without any investment if a young man wants immense and quick gains there can be no better way than to become one of these unscrupulous gurus the trade has fallen to such depths that now there are gurus available who can through the nation's postal service send to their distant disciples packets of grace and glory of curative strength failure proof talismans child bearing seeds or even packets of god's own vermilion glory all these all these mind you at a reasonable rate quoted x go down sankra's statement here does not of course advocate such a free trade in ignominy a true teacher of inner vision and perfect life cannot by any logic come to dispense a greater share of his grace on people of his choice nor can he withhold his grace from some others in fact the distribution of grace is not controlled by the guru but depends upon the capacity of the recipient the perfected man living absorbed in the self equally disseminates joyous perfection cheer and bliss to all at all times it depends upon the equipments that approach him to take a greater or a lesser share of it the ocean does not put a ban upon the quantity of water that you can carry from it the limitations are the limitations of your own pot the sun does not rasen its light from house to house or from room to room but it is the walls that deny the entry of sunlight into a room the river flows everything depends upon the canals that you can cut to take its water to your land similarly the guru living in perfection gives out knowledge in the language of his own intimate experience and it is up to the individual seekers to get for themselves as much benefit as they can this shows that when a seeker has developed in himself viveka vairagya and shad sampatti his mumukshtva increases automatically and he who has these four qualities can come in contact with the guru more profitably the greater the degree contact with the guru more profitably the greater the degree to which they manifest in an individual the more will be the more will he be in tune with the master and he will be able to understand the significance of the teacher's words completely and exhaustively verse number 29 vairagyam cha mumukshtvam tivram yasya to vidyate tasmin anne varth bhavanta hai syo phalvanta hai samadhe calmness and other practices have their meaning and they bear fruit indeed only in him who has an intense spirit of renunciation and yearning for liberation 
there are many seekers who having practiced for long the six requirements such as calmness etc complain that they have not progressed at all vedantic practices are not a training in ethics or morality these great qualities are mainly to create an ethical and moral atmosphere in the psychological field of the neophyte there are many spiritual cowards who ask merely by living an honest life can we not reach the perfection which is explained as godhood this question has become very common these days and people in confusion and perhaps intellectual fatigue refuse to make a thorough study of the shastras such people claim for themselves as a true living in their honest and devoted in life they say i am very dutiful i earn honestly i look after my home and my dependents and to the extent i can afford it i share my wealth with others in a spirit of charity i believe that i am a nobler soul soul than those who practice the so called spiritual discipline <coughs> this wrong notion has been blasted by sankara in his statement that the qualities of self restraint self control purity etc can bear fruit only when they are in an individual who has a complete sense of detachment born out of discrimination and a burning aspiration to surmount the limitations of his mortal existence the destiny of some of those i have met who were living an honest life all the time is indeed heart rending they live in the world in sensuous excesses running after the mires of wealth power popularity enjoyments etc and though their means are fair their goal has always been low and finite so in their pilgrimage through life whenever they come across a ditch of hatred or a mount of challenge they sit back fatigued and weary and blame religion and their own philosophy based upon hollow and meaningless ethical living since spiritual evolution is not the outcome of their pure living whenever the scheme of things around them changes they find themselves lost without spiritual stamina no one can stand up to the threats and onslaughts of circumstances in life it is therefore that sama etc cannot bear fruit unless they grow in a heart watered by detachment and plowed by an intense wish for liberation verse number 30 etyo etyor mandata yatre virakte mumukshayo maro salil vatrashe samdam nimatrata sama etc become as ineffectual as the mirage in the desert in him who has a weak detachment and yearning for freedom the idea expressed in the previous verse is now reinforced with another statement sankara says that sama etc cannot even ever wait in a ever wait in a bosom where detachment is weak and the yearning for liberation brittle spasmodic and eccentric seekers who are now facing a blind alley in their progress may very well look upon look back upon their own wasteful days and reequip themselves for a shorter and faster flight to success a correct understanding about themselves will certainly give them the secret key to the hall of success in those who have neither the spirit of detachment from the unreal 
nor a consistent aspiration to evolve true calmness etc cannot flourish the acharya says that in such people self control self restraint joy and happiness are all mere delusions they are only a similitude of reality they do not thrive well and flower forth to bear fruits this we can observe even among many of our present day mahatmas who by their dress and profession declare their detachment and mokshtva and yet in their life they seem to enjoy no calmness etc to experience no joy to practice no self control in such individuals where true vairagya and mokshtva are absent sama etc can never bear fruit or grow or even germinate stanza number 31 bhakti firm and deep moksh karan samargayam bhakti rev griyasi sav swarupa nusandhanam bhakti ra bhadiyate among the instruments and conditions necessary for liberation bhakti alone is supreme a constant attempt to live up to one's own real nature is called single pointed devotion assuming that the seeker has a large share of intelligent detachment a cons a conspicuous amount of anxiety to liberate himself from his inborn weaknesses and also a fully developed moral and ethical life the question comes to one's mind what practice should one adopt in order to integrate oneself into a proportionately beautiful divine existence according to vedanta the means of self integration on the path of knowledge is atma vichar or constant meditation upon the nature of the eternal self but sankara makes use of a popular word to indicate the subtle practice of meditation for this there are critics who complain that the prachanna bodha the veiled buddhist as they sometimes call sankara is playing upon the credulity of the people and luring them into his own den there are dwaitins who criticize this verse and say that the acharya is deceiving true seekers by the word bhakti misinterpreted and misconceived as pure meditation sankara says that bhakti is the path but he adds a could he still explaining the term bhakti according to him bhakti is not a practice of bhagri at the feet of a noble ideal however transcendental it may be but he defines it openly as a constant and consistent effort at raising the ego center from the welter of its false values to the memory and dignity of selfhood in thus defining bhakti sankara cannot be criticized at the least not by those who understand what he says bhakti as it has come down to us today represents almost a superstitious conception stinking in its decadence a moral dread a disgusting intellectual slavery a crawling mental attitude a blind dependence upon a supreme god to take us away from all our self created mischiefs so we find a self ruined society being faithfully courted by courted by a profit seeking priest class functioning generally from spiritually polluted centers which have come to be called temples those who visit temples with the seeming symptoms of devotion after psychoanalysis are found to be a set of helpless personalities with neither the courage to face life nor the conviction to renounce 
neither the mental stamina to live nor the intellectual vigor to inquire, neither the imagination to believe nor the daring to disbelieve. They are mainly a crowd of men flocking towards the sanctum, half in fear and half in deluded hopes. Such a devotee in the presence of his brimstone reigning God who will be angry at every weakness of the mortal but can be a convenient abettor of the devotee's own criminal intentions in society and life cannot be expected to grow spiritually or to gain any satisfaction from his religion. This is an ugly caricature of the great theory of bhakti as expounded by <coughs> Vyasa in his Narta Bhakti Sutra. According to the Bhakti Sutra, God devotion has been described as para anurakti, the supreme unquestioned unmotivated love for the Lord which seeks no reward. As as Kahalil Gibran beautifully puts it, love gives not but itself and takes not but itself. Love possesses not, nor would it be possessed, for love is sufficient unto love. This being so, the best of love is in the lover's attunement with the beloved. The attunement is successful to the degree the lover identifies himself with the beloved. Thus identification is the measuring road of love. When the identification is complete, love is fulfilled. Identification of the little ego with all its weaknesses, imperfections and limitations with the absolute reality, Perfection, bliss, knowledge is achieved through a constant remembrance of the nature of self. When the finite ego gets released from its false notions of limitations, it discovers itself to be nothing other than the supreme and in this self-discovery it experiences complete identification with the self. Then alone is love entirely fulfilled. This <coughs> process is accomplished through a constant awareness of the divine in us, which can be maintained only if we maintain in ourselves an unbroken stream of divine thoughts. So, Anusandhan, when it is unbroken, increases the frequency of divine thoughts in us and when the frequency of such thoughts comes to the degree of frequency with which the ego idea now persists in our hearts, we shall be able to experience the divine as intimately and freely as we experience now our egocentric life. Therefore, when we reread the verse with a correct understanding of the practical implication of Atma Vichar and the suggestions of Bhakti Marga, we find that Sankara is only too right when he says that for those who want to walk the path of knowledge and reach the ultimate, the most efficient technique is Bhakti restated in its correct meaning. Courtesy of Approach and Questioning, stanza number 32. Sau atam tatva anusandhanam bhaktiri te pare jaguhu ukt sadhan sampan sat tatve jijyasur atmanah upasthi de gurum prajyam yasmat bandh vi mokshanam. Others say that bhakti means a constant inquiry into the real nature of one's own self, one who has the above mentioned qualifications and is anxious to know the self must therefore devotedly serve, serve a teacher well established in knowledge for redeeming himself from boundaries. 
continuing the definition of bhakti sankra quotes some other great writers who had declared before him that true devotion lies in a constant awareness of one's own real nature there is a subtle difference between the previous definition and the present the previous definition prescribes the path by which devotion is gained and this one declares love as its own goal one is said to be devoted to his profession when he is constantly aware of his duties in his profession a full time dedicated life towards any activity is called even in everyday life as devotion examples of devoted wife devoted son devoted husband devoted student etc are not uncommon usages in our language to live as the self and to meet others in life standing upon this solid foundation of the true nature of the self is the culmination of knowledge and this is termed by sankara as bhakti that is he defines bhakti both as the means and the end love is the means to gain love the path of the seeker is through love to love in the hinting at the glory of devotion the author continues prescribing other practices necessary for a vedantic seeker during his evolution a seeker who has the necessary qualifications in order that he may be rendered from his inner weaknesses attachments animalism and false values is advised to serve with the devotion as a teacher who is well established in the experience of the self we have already described the guru trick in india which has made a credulous society fall so precipitously into the depths of utter decadence as without an instructor we cannot learn even a simple thing like opening the door of a car or typing or even the art of eating we cannot deny the need of a teacher for instructing us to live intelligently the difficulties nowadays is to find the right type of teacher whom the scriptures call the guru sankra indicates the qualities of the guru by the pregnant expression pragyam pragnyam meaning one who is established in the intimate experience of the divine consciousness in himself upasana of the guru is not a mere survival attendance upon him in an attitude of growing disgust or in a mood of melancholy dissatisfaction the disciple out of sheer love and reverence for the master forgets himself and serves him at all times and in all possible ways thereby the student is made to remember constantly the glories and the noble qualities of the master this constant mental awareness of the ideal through the persons of the guru slowly and steadily raises the moral tempo and ethical goodness in the new fight who finds himself well established in his inner purity which would otherwise have taken him painfully long years to dwell again this sort of love making with the guru not through the heart and its sentiments but through the intellect and its uh, idealization makes the disciple efficient to set himself in unison with the master which is essential for the student if he is to really benefit by the master's original ideas minted in the sheer zone inner experiences when suggestive words of deep import are given out by a teacher in his moments of inspiration the student at once understands the teacher it is for this reason that sankara is compelled to declare that as a result of guru upasana the disciple becomes capable of liberating himself from his limitations 
स्टेंजा नंबर थर्टी थ्री श्रोत्रियो वर्जीनो काम हतो यो ब्रह्म वित्तम ब्रह्मन प्रत शांतो निरिंद नवानल अहेतु कदिया सिंधुर बंधुर नार मताम सताम ही हु इज वेल वर्स्ड इन द स्क्रिप्चर्स सिनलेस अनएफ्लिक्टेड बाय डिजायर्स ए फुल नोर ऑफ द सुप्रीम हु हैज रिटायर्ड इनटू द सुप्रीम हु इज एज काम एज द फायर दैट हैज बर्न्ड अप इट्स फ्यूल हु इज ए बाउंडलेस ocean of mercy that needs no cause for its expression and who is an intimate friend of those who have surrendered unto him sankra exhaust his list of adjectives in enumerating the qualities of the true guru to supplement his declaration that the master should be well established in the supreme consciousness he adds here certain qualities which on a closer observation reveal that every man of realization and wisdom cannot aspire to and become an efficient teacher of spirituality to guide and instruct a deluded soul and help him to unwind himself and unravel the naughty traits in him one must have something more than a perfect experience the teacher must no doubt have full realization but he must also have a complete grasp of the great scriptures without the study of the scriptures even the self realized master will not have the language or the technique of expression to convey his profound knowledge to his disciples apart from spiritual knowledge and erudition the guru must also have great self control and the immense riches of a well developed heart he must have an irresistible flow of mercy which demands no special cause for its manifestation especially when it descends upon those who have surrendered themselves to him having reached his feet as spiritual refuges it is well it is well known that in all constitutions laws are prescribed both for the governors and the governed since this is a test laying down the rules for spiritual progress sankra is as vehement in prescribing specifications for a true and honest teacher as he is in describing the prerequisites for a spiritual aspirant so i conclude this video at this stage next video we'll start with stanza number 34 thank you for watching this video namaskar my dear friends thank you